Hello, everyone, and welcome to another weekend of the fifth annual Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. We have an amazing program in store for you today for our second weekend, and we are so excited to have you here. Please know that subtitles will be available one week after each of our events, along with the live recording of today's event being available in both English and Spanish subtitles. This year, we have moved our event online due to the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected all of our communities and is our sincerest hope that you and your family members are staying healthy and safe. For our fifth year of hosting the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival, we wanted to adapt the event to this virtual platform so that everyone could still join us. Last week, we started the event around the special theme of getting our hands dirty. And today we have created a schedule filled with exciting cooking demos, interviews, and performances, all celebrating the diversity and culture of Vallejo. Our theme for this week is Home and Hearth, and we are also celebrating Filipino American History Month. Here's a little bit more information. The entire month of October is Filipino American History Month, and this was established in 1988 by a nonprofit organization known as the Filipino American National Historical Society. The month long celebration commemorates the first pre recorded presence of Filipinos in the continental United States, which occurred on October 18, 1587, when Luzonas Indios came ashore on a Spanish galleon ship that landed at what is now Morro Bay, California. In case you didn't know, Filipinos and Filipino Americans are the second largest Asian group in the United States. And today we have a special sneak preview that will be extra special for all of our Filipinx audience members, but you will have to stay till the end to see it. To celebrate our theme for today, let's get comfy and cozy while we learn the importance of our food choices, take a tour of a worker-owned cooperative, and we have not one, but three vegan Filipinx cooking demonstrations that are sure to please the whole family. To round out our time today, we have enchanting Hawaiian and Tahitian dance performances, and we will take a look at a local business that offers healthy vegan options in the beautiful city of Vallejo. At the end of today's program, we will respond to all of your questions that you have for us. You can send us your questions throughout the event using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And we will respond to them at the end of today's program during the Q&A session. We are also pleased to announce that if you are one of the first 16 par participants who is a Vallejo resident, we will be giving you a free vegan cookbook. To make sure that you can receive your cookbook, please make sure you have filled out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. So to get our day started, I want to introduce the organization behind this amazing festival, Food Empowerment Project or FEP for short. FEP is a registered nonprofit 501c3 that promotes veganism, fights for farm workers, works on the lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities, and encourages people not to buy chocolate sourced from some of the worst forms of child labor. The upcoming video will introduce you to our work and our hope for our planet and its inhabitants. And that hope is that for everyone to better understand the connections between people, non-human animals, and our environment. Please welcome into your home, Food Empowerment Project. Food is power. Our food system is a huge interconnected web stretching across the globe. It links fields to factories, human animals to non-human animals, workers to corporations. When we choose what to have for dinner, we're not just choosing what to eat, we're also choosing whether or not to support the industries that put the food on our plates. That's a lot of responsibility, but it's a lot of power too. For those of us who are able to make informed, ethical food choices, we can make a real difference in the lives of humans, non-human animals, and the earth. At Food Empowerment Project, or FEP, we believe that our food choices can change the world and we want to show you how. The most incredible thing our food choices can do is reduce the amount of suffering in the world. How? Well, 
Each year, tens of billions of non-human animals are exploited in our food production systems. Each one of them is an individual who is aware of their own existence, feels pleasure and pain, and wants to be safe and free. They are confined, separated from their families, mutilated, and killed. Our food choices can reduce the amount of suffering of non-human animals when cutting out meat, dairy, and other animal products. FEP promotes ethical veganism, encouraging people not to contribute to the exploitation and suffering of animals, both human and non-human. Our website is full of information to help people understand the power of their food choices and learn how these choices can impact non-human animals from chickens and rabbits to fishes and other sea creatures. And it also includes some recipes and meal ideas. To support this further, Food Empowerment Project has created two vegan websites, one featuring delicious Mexican food in English and Spanish, and one with amazing Filipinx recipes in English and Tagalog to help people go and stay vegan. So ethical veganism is important, but not everybody can get the kind of food they need for a healthy plant-based diet. If we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables, we need to make sure that all people have access to fresh, affordable produce. In black and brown communities and in low-income neighborhoods, access to fresh fruit and vegetables is often limited or non-existent. It is vital that we acknowledge the ways that racism and economic disadvantage prevent marginalized communities from being able to access healthier food. When invited, FEP makes an assessment on the availability of healthy foods and begins to work with local communities, policymakers, and community organizations. We then convene focus groups to determine the barriers seen and experienced by the community to help create solutions that will benefit the health of individuals over corporations. But we can't stop there. We want to get fresh produce on more shelves and on more plates. And those fruits and vegetables have to come from somewhere. We want people to think about the ways their food choices can reduce the suffering of non-human animals in our food system. But what about the humans in that system? Farm workers are some of the most vulnerable and exploited workers in the United States. They often work long hours in extreme heat, are exposed to agricultural chemicals, and many experience homelessness due to their low wages or wage theft. Also, many are migrant or undocumented workers who are threatened with deportation if they speak up, which leaves them vulnerable to a variety of abuses. In addition, female farm workers experience sexual harassment on a regular basis. We advocate for improvements to farm worker rights at corporate, legislative, and regulatory levels. In 2018, we helped overturn a rule that had forced the families of farm workers to move at least 50 miles away from the migrant camps when picking season was over a regulation that negatively impacted their children's education. This victory meant that their children could now finish their school year without having to move. On a grassroots level, FEP organizes a school supply drive for the children of farm workers to help ensure these kids are offered all the opportunities that come with an education, something their parents have sacrificed so much for so that they might have opportunities previous generations may not have had. The fight for farm workers' rights doesn't end at the borders of the United States. We have a responsibility to the people who supply us with our food, even when they're on the other side of the world. Some of the worst human rights abuses in our food system happen in the supply chain for that confection we all love so much, chocolate. The chocolate industry gets much of its key ingredient, cacao, from areas where the worst forms of child labor and slavery are most prevalent. Children as young as seven work long hours using dangerous equipment and in some cases are not allowed to leave the farms they work on and are beaten and sometimes not seen again if they try to flee. 
They go through all this just to make candy for us to eat halfway around the world. By informing people where their chocolate comes from, we can create transparency to help people eat with their ethics. On our website, Food Empowerment Project has a list of chocolate companies to let consumers know which companies we do and do not recommend based on the country of origin for their cacao. And we even have a free downloadable app to make it easy for those who have a smartphone. Be sure to look out for our mascot, Chavez, to see which chocolates we recommend. Our food choices are powerful. That means people are powerful. And that means you are powerful. Food Empowerment Project is about showing people just how much power their food choices hold. We want everybody to understand how much good their food choices can do, how much suffering we can stop. But we understand that making the world more just and equal is not a simple task. We can't just think about humans or just non-human animals or just the earth. We have to understand the way that these things are interconnected and the complicated systems they create. Together, we can help each other understand the whole picture. Then, we can work toward a better world. Remember, food is power. Use it with compassion. Thank you for taking this time to learn more about Food Empowerment Project and the work we do. We hope this helped you better understand our organization and our connections to one another and to our planet. Next, to talk to us about the importance of animals and why compassion towards animals is important is Brenda Sanders, the Executive Director of the Afro Vegan Society. The Afro Vegan Society is a, non, a national nonprofit organization with a mission to provide resources and support to help people in marginalized communities transition to healthy vegan living. Executive Director Brenda Sanders is a vegan food justice activist who co-founded Thrive Baltimore, a community resource center that offers free classes, cooking demos, and other programming that supports people to live a healthier, more sustainable lifestyle. In addition to Thrive Baltimore, Brenda is the co-creator of Vegan Soul Fest, an annual festival that celebrates diversity and all aspects of vegan living. And she is also the co-owner of The Greener Kitchen, a vegan deli and food distributor that produces plant-based foods that are both affordable and accessible. Now, here to talk about the importance of compassion towards animals, please welcome Brenda Sanders. Hi, I'm Brenda Sanders and I'm Executive Director of Afro Vegan Society and I am a food justice activist, which means that I work to make sure that there are healthy, nutritious plant foods in communities that don't often have access to those foods. Because uh, as we all know, in many communities, uh, the worst possible, most unhealthy animal products are being pushed on people and so you know i'm just working to make sure that our food system is fair and that it's equitable and that everyone has the ability to be able to choose to eat healthy nutritious plant foods and so in my work i'm often talking about uh the dangers the health uh concerns around eating meat and dairy and eggs and other animal products and how unhealthy meat and dairy and eggs are. Um, and a lot of people who do food justice work also talk a lot about meat and dairy and eggs and other animal products. But one thing that people who are doing food justice work don't often talk about is what is behind meat and dairy and eggs. You know, we don't talk about the fact that there are animals behind these products, that um, you know, meat is the flesh of animals and dairy is the mother's milk of cows and that eggs are the ova of chickens. We just don't often talk about the animals themselves. And I think that the reason for that is that it just makes us uncomfortable. 
um, we don't want to talk about animals in talking about food because most of us don't really even want to think about the fact that when we are eating animal products, we're eating the product of an animal's body. And so in my work, you know, when I'm uh, doing lectures or I'm conducting workshops and when I do talk about animals, oftentimes people say like, oh, don't say that. I don't want to think about that. Uh, there was probably a time when I didn't want to think about the fact that uh, it, it what I was actually eating um, used to be an animal or it's the product from an animal. And I think that there's a good reason for that. And I think that that discomfort is important. I think that we need to really look at the discomfort that many of us feel when thinking about the idea of an animal being harmed or an animal being killed or an animal being used for the foods that we're eating because maybe that's something that uh, instead of avoiding it we actually need to look at head on and and analyze why we're feeling that discomfort or that reluctance to talk about that and i think that the fact of the matter is that most of us care about animals. Most of us, even if we're not animal lovers, we do care about what happens to animals. Um, if we saw a pig just walking down the middle of the street, I mean, I don't know why a pig would be walking down the middle of the street, but if we did see a pig walking down the street and someone just walked up with a baseball bat and started beating the pig, we would not feel good about that. We would want them to stop. And a lot of us would even run and try to make them stop hurting the pig or cow or chicken or, or cat or dog or whatever animal. And I think that that's important. I think that's a big part of our humanity and what makes us human is that we would feel bad to see an animal being harmed right in front of us. And so it was through thinking about those kinds of things that I personally came to the conclusion that I don't want to, you know, pay someone to harm an animal. I don't want someone to pay someone to kill an animal just for me to eat, especially once I realized that there were so many other foods that I can eat. There are so many other foods uh, that are available, that are wonderful, that are delicious, that are nutritious. Um, and then it sort of stretched out into other parts of my life as well. Um, you know, looking at animals as a form of entertainment or, you know, wearing animal skins and things like that. And so for me, that was a part of my journey. And so I like to open that up for anybody else who I am talking to um, in my work, just in case, you know, there are other people who would choose to make different choices as well. You know, and it's not about judging people for doing this or that, but it's just about making sure that people have the option to make a choice. They know that there's another choice that they can make. And that's what my work at Afro Vegan Society is about. I am all about educating people so that they know what their choices are and then they can make a different choice if they so choose. And so for me, if I were to say what my best case scenario would be, of course, it would be a world where human beings, um, you know, we, eat, we eat plants, uh, we care and love for each other, and we leave animals off our plate. So thank you so much for listening. I am just so happy to be a part of this event. Um, and I just wish the best for everyone participating. Please be healthy, stay safe, and take care. Thank you so much for sharing why it's important for us to think of the animals and why our food choices are so important, Brenda. I'm not sure, I'm sure that video gave us all a lot to think about. Well, I hope you are not hungry because it is time for our cooking demos. Today, as we are cooking at home, we want folks to gather around one another to watch these special recipes that we have for you today. These meals are homey, welcoming, and the types of meals you share with the ones you love. Today's cuisine is all about taking a look at some delicious Filipino foods in honor of Filipino American History Month. For our first cooking demo today, we have Mrs. Maria and her daughter Cecilia, who make up the family cooking sensation known as Vegan Cooking Mom. The dynamic mother-daughter duo have a model about their cooking, and that is to make food made from the heart. 
Both Maria and her daughter, are Cecilia, are Vallejo residents and have been vegan for over two years. Cecilia went vegan first, and now she and her family enjoy traditional Filipino dishes such as ube flan and tocino with garlic rice. The only difference is that the dishes are 100% vegan. Here to show us how to make Filipino beef steak or the steak, please join me and welcome Vegan Cooking Mom. Welcome to Vegan Cooking Mom's cooking video on how to cook Filipino beef steak or bis steak. We will be using Better Choose Philly Shredded Steak. The first step is to marinate the beef in the following ingredients. Water or sparkling water, soy sauce, citrus juice, and sugar for 15 to 30 minutes. Heat oil over medium heat. To check if the oil is ready, put a barbecue stick in the oil and see if the oil bubbles. Add the beef into the pan, set aside the sauce, and saute beef until brown. Set beef aside. Heat oil over medium heat. Saute sliced onions for two minutes. Add remaining sauce to onions. Set aside onions with the beef. Next, we will make the sauce. Add citrus juice. Add arrowroot to thicken the sauce. Now pour the sauce over the beef and onions. I like my Filipino beef steak or beef steak served over a warm bed of rice. Enjoy Filipino beef steak or beef steak. Thank you for watching and happy eating. Seasick is a Filipino snack or it's a gallo called punten. So for example, you're getting together with your friends at a party or celebration and you're enjoying, let's say, a nice cold beer. What do you usually reach out for? You usually reach out for let's say, peanuts or fries or chips. Well, in the Philippines, Filipinos usually crave for seasick and it is widely popular, not just in one region of the Philippines. Well, Philippines is a collection of many islands, but uh, Sisig is widely recognized all over the uh, Philippines, but also among Filipinos from all over the globe. It has a nice, savory, and fatty flavor and texture. If you want to enjoy it, but you're watching your health, the vegan version is definitely a healthier alternative for you. If you are already vegan, but if you miss your seasick, 
this is a great way to enjoy your sisig again without sacrificing your vegan lifestyle. And if you haven't heard of vegan uh, sisig or sisig at all, then I think this is a great way for you to give it a shot and see what uh, Filipinos love so much about this dish. So let's get started. So for the marinade, we have one half cup soy sauce, one fourth cup coconut vinegar. It's best to use coconut vinegar, but if you can't find any, then any regular vinegar will be fine. Three fourths tablespoon of sugar, one half teaspoon of whole peppercorns. So that's for the marinade. And for the saute, we'll need one half tablespoon of ginger, diced, two cloves of garlic, mint, two chili pepper. If you want it to be spicier, then you may want to add more. You also want to reserve some whole chili pepper for a garnish. One half yellow onion, diced. One tablespoon of calamansi, or in English, calamandin, citrus juice. If you don't have access to calamansi, you may use your favorite citrus. For the main ingredients of our sisig, we will use a variety of mushrooms. Seven pieces or about one four pound of shiitake mushrooms, diced, two ounces of peach mushrooms, diced, about 12 pieces of oyster mushrooms, diced. So you just pretty much want it to have equal portions of each mushrooms and you want them all diced. One block of firm high quality tofu. I'm using here pot de soy firm tofu, two cube sizes. We'll grab a big bowl here and combine all of our ingredients for the marinade. We want to keep mixing just to incorporate everything together and then uh, after that we'll move on to the tofu if you're not using a lot of sisig if you're not gonna cook sisig for that many people it may be inconvenient for you to use a charcoal grill then you can just use um, a grill pan with a hopper stove here turning it on and grill the tofu this way you may also use an indoor electrical grill, or you could fry using a cast iron pan. So we'll just drop them there. So if you're gonna fry using a cast iron pan, you just wanna add just a little bit of fat by uh, adding, I'm using here refined coconut oil for that nice fatty flavor without the coconut taste and then add our tofu here so it's important to use firm tofu because if you're not then you will have a harder tougher time to grill the tofu or fry the tofu because there's going to be a lot of moisture and water inside. We want that nice creamy curd flavor with a slight char. It will be hard to get that char, that nice slight char flavor and that uh, creamy curd flavor if we're not using firm and high quality tofu. So as you could see that the tofu has a lot of browning all over it so so as far as this one there are lines and in this there's nice crunchy browning over there so using the same cast iron pan here turn back the heat another medium heat and then we'll add the 
refined coconut oil. This is my choice of oil for this recipe because we want that fatty flavor. If you don't have any, you may use your favorite high smoke oil like canola or peanut oil. So I just cook about two tablespoons of refined coconut oil. I said refined because unrefined will have that strong coconut flavor and you don't want that strong coconut taste in this seasoning recipe. Okay. So once that you feel that it's quite hot enough, then we'll drop all of our seasoning, our aromatics together. The garlic, the ginger, and the onion. So we'll start the garlic. Turn it out a bit, probably for a good 10 seconds. Then we'll add the ginger. Another five, eight seconds there. Then we'll add the onions. Last but not the least, if you want a slight kick to your seasoning, then the chili pepper. Oops. Get this one out. So see how many chili pepper you want. I only use two because I want it spicy but not too spicy. Once you've seen that the Aromatics are getting a little translucent. Then we put all of our mushroom. Mm. Oh my gosh, it even looks like the traditional seafood. For the last part, we'll add our Nicely grilled tofu. Seasick is so popular that it branched out from being just a bar food to being a main entree. So you will even notice that restaurants in the Philippines will carry this even if the you know they're serving it for lunch or for dinner and enjoy it with a side of fries. Okay, now it's time to add the calamansi. Winner. Okay, now time to serve. If you have a fajita plate or a sizzling plate, then I highly recommend to use that when you're serving your seasick because it will have a nice sizzle when you're presenting it to your guests. So time to serve. And we happen to have a bottle of beer to go along with it. And if you wanted to make it look nicer, then you can Garnish with colorful chili peppers, which you might end up having extra. So just do that right there. And this is optional, but you can add a dollop of vegan mayonnaise. You may find vegan mayonnaise at your specialty stores or health stores. You can also make your own, um, but I'm using here store-bought vegan mayonnaise to put on top uh, to replace putting an egg on top. So like I said, this is optional. There you go. What we have here is a vegan seasick with 
nice kick in different kinds of aromatics from the ginger and other seasoning like garlic, onions, and um, this first texture, we have many kinds of mushrooms that we've put in there as well as the nice uh, char from our tofu. And it's, like I said, I'm going to emphasize, you have to use good quality tofu that is extra firm for you to make this seasick. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am excited. My mouth is watering again to try this. Tighten up this eat. Pancit Palabok is a noodle dish great for parties and celebrations. It has three parts, the noodles, the sauce, and the toppings. Let's give it a vegan twist, shall we? We have here some tofu frying. And I'm using here my trusty splatter screen. If you want a clean stove, if you don't want to make a huge mess, then I suggest getting one of these. The secret to frying tofu is to pat it dry before you fry it. Also, you do not want to overcrowd the pan. We are moving on to the other contents of our sauce. We're going to use about four cloves of garlic. So we are going to use half of the garlic for the saute and half of the garlic as a topping. Looks like our tofu is ready, so we will transfer that to a plate. To keep it crispy, we will sprinkle some salt, put the garlic, and we're going to use the same pan. So as you can see here, we have the fried garlic and the super fried garlic, this is just dark brown. This is going to be our topping, and this one is going to be part of the uh, vegetable saute. We are going to use a different pan, a new pan. We're going to turn the heat on, and then while that's heating, we'll prepare the vegetables. I'm only going to need half. Cut it horizontally. So right there. Then we put oil now. So. Just enough to cover the base of the pan. We have two kinds of vegetables in our sauce. Green beans and the carrots. So we'll start off with the green beans. Now bonus points if you can cut this the traditional way. It's slim, it's skinny, and it's diagonal. What I suggest is that we'll also do the trick is just to cut them into pieces. Cut the other end. It looks like our oil is ready, so we'll put the sauté garlic here. While we're waiting for that to sauté a little bit, we'll continue on with the green beans. Small cubes are fine. It will actually have a better crunch when you're biting into it. Then we put the onions. We will transfer the green beans. After that, we'll move on to the carrots. I like to use uh, organic carrots because they're mildly sweeter. It's usually best to cut a slice off so that you can have a flat surface. Then cut that horizontal and then cut it lengthwise. While we are cutting the vegetables, we will get the broth of the sauce ready. So we have here a pot of about 8 to 10 cups of water. We will turn back on so it's already hot but we'll put it into a boil. We'll add the carrots. So basically you want equal amounts of green beans and carrots. And while that we're sauteing that, we'll add a little bit of sea salt, just a little bit. So we saute for about three to five minutes. While we are waiting for our water to boil, we will grab the cornstarch here and add a little bit of water. The reason why we want to dissolve cornstarch, this is going to be our thickening agent for our sauce. So we'll just grab one of these so we can dissolve it completely because if we add cornstarch directly to the pot, it will create a lot of lumps. So once that's completely dissolved, we'll move on to our coloring agent, which is anato powder, otherwise known as achuete. This will provide the reddish orange hue to our sauce. And then we mix it. Probably we're going to add, all in all, one-fourth cup. And you can get this at Asian stores, Filipino stores. I got this at Island Pacific Filipino store. 
So while we're dissolving that, it looks like this is done. So we're gonna turn off the heat here and we'll move on because we already have a boiling pot of water. So we're gonna pour the cornstarch bit by bit, constantly stir. As you could see, the viscosity of our soup is getting thicker. You would want it even thicker. So we're gonna add a few more here. We're gonna add our vegetable broth. We'll start off with two to three tablespoons. This is vegetable broth powder. It is chicken flavor. It doesn't have any animal products, but it does have that chicken flavor to it. It is vegan. The reason why I like to use uh, chicken flavor is because it will have that reminiscent of the palabok taste that I grew up eating in the Philippines. If you do not want to go that route, regular vegetable broth will be just fine. Now it's time to put our natural food coloring. We will put bit by bit. So I'm gonna pour it in to have that reddish orange. So far we have added six to seven tablespoons of anato powder or achuete. Now it's time to taste it. So this is the eighth tablespoon. See if it has enough vegetable broth. It needs more vegetable broth. So we're gonna add about two to three more tablespoons. This is when you adjust the flavor, just the amount of vegetable broth that you put into your sauce. It's very good. Seems like we're almost done here. Let's turn off the stove and we will combine the vegetables with the sauce. So we pour the sauce to the pan. Just a few for now. And we put the tofu. Turn back the heat on to low, low heat because the sauce was already boiling. We just want everything to simmer all together. Probably put a little bit more of the sauce here. It's okay now if the sauce is a little soupy because later on, because of the cornstarch, it will get thicker. In fact, once it gets cold, it gets really lumpy. So make sure you just put it back to the stove and heat it again so that it will loosen up. The many different textures of the vegetables from the carrots to the green beans to the tofu provides a wonderful crunch. Turn off the heat and our sauce is done. Now moving on to the noodles. The wonderful thing about palabok is that the noodles doesn't require a lot of cooking. In fact, all you need is just to soak it in water and it will get soft right away. Just make sure that there are no dirt. You just want to clean it up some more. This is rice and cornstarch noodles. You can grab this at any Asian and Filipino stores. I got this at Island Pacific. They have an aisle for it. Just look for the pancit noodles and you'll find this. So we're gonna grab this container and one of these strainers and scoop out the noodles. And there you have it. We have one big container of pancit palabok noodles and we will quickly blanch it in boiling water. So our water is boiling it. We turned it off. We switched the pots here. Transfer it all the way there. And within a minute, we wanna remove it. So basically, we just wanna make sure that it's we quickly blanch and then we're gonna transfer it here. It's all right if it has a little bit of water in it because the noodles will absorb it anyway without it being too soggy. Now we have a bed of noodles ready and we are going to put a little bit of sauce to incorporate in the noodles. We're going to scoop out from the extra bowl of soup that we have that didn't have any veggies in it. So we're pouring a little bit of that and then mix it. So basically we just need a little bit of the flavor to get into the noodles. All right, it looks like we are ready for our toppings. We are going to scoop out the vegetables. Look at that. So festive, perfect for parties, big gatherings, potlucks. And this is not even done yet. We are still going to put 
more on top. I found this at Island Pacific. There is a vegan chicharron, which is vegan pork rinds. Um, this is such a revelation to me and it's a Filipino product. So I was very stoked to find this. I just crushed them. They're originally uh, in a bag of chips or they were originally a bag of chips. So I would sprinkle on top. Now I understand if you want the healthier route and you don't want something processed like this, then I also crumbled some tofu for the same texture. And this pretty much, you just crumble the tofu by your hand and then fry the heck out of it. We are putting the green onions on top. And last but not the least, we're going to put some citrus. We are gonna add, last but not the least, the calamansi or the calamandin citrus. In the Philippines, this is what we use as garnish for our pansit palabok. We usually leave it up to the guests to squeeze it. It's part of the experience too. If you do not have access to calamansi, here in California, lemons are in season. And remember the garlic that we sauteed a while ago to have it um, extra fried? Well, we're gonna put that last on top here. And we are done. Doesn't that look festive to you? Okay, and that time. Mm -hmm. Alright. I like the sauce. Say siya yung idea niya yung lagay mo na yung noodles ng konte. Tapos lagyan din ng sauce yung tap sa ibabaw. Hindi na nga makasalita sa sarap eh. It's really good. Daddy, you want some more? More. Second more. round. More dosha. Yeah. Right. Sa Pilipinas, binibili namin siya sa kalendriya. Oh. <laughs> Ilagay sa plastic bag. <laughs> this is perfect for potlucks, for social gatherings, big parties. This will reassure that you will have a healthy option, a vegan Filipino option at your next get together. Kaina, let's eat! Another big thanks to Mrs. Maria, Cecilia, and RG for welcoming us into your kitchens and sharing how delicious Filipinx food can be. As a bonus, you can find all the recipes made today and more at our website, veganfilipinofood.com. As a reminder that if you're one of the first 16 participants who is a Vallejo resident, you'll, you will receive a free vegan cookbook. To make sure you can receive your cookbook, please make sure you have filled out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. Next, we are so excited to take a tour of the amazing Mandela Grocery Cooperative and learn more about the impact worker-owned cooperatives can have on communities. Mandela Grocery Cooperative has been working with Food Empowerment Project for years to help us bring a worker-owned cooperative to Vallejo. In addition to partnering with us at our three community meetings to discuss the importance of creating access to healthy foods, they have also joined us in speaking out with policymakers. But before we dive into the history of Mandela Grocery Cooperative, you may wonder, what is a grocery store cooperative or co-op? Essentially, a worker-owned co-op is a business that is owned and governed by its workers, which means the decision-making is made by the workers, and along with having a say in what the co-op does or does not do, the profits from the business stay within the community, unlike big corporate stores. The Mandela Grocery Cooperative was born out of the desire to improve access to healthy food and business ownership for residents in West Oakland. Prior to Mandela Grocery Cooperative opening in 2009, there had not been a grocery store on 7th Street since the 1960s. We see many similarities between West Oakland and Vallejo and are so glad to have Mandela support in helping us to bring access to healthy foods to some of the most impacted folks in Vallejo. Now, please join me in a tour of the Mandela Grocery Co-op and maybe you'll see something you might wanna purchase on your next trip to West Oakland. All right, so we're here at Mandela Grocery Co-op and want to talk about why worker co-ops are important for communities to thrive. And um, the really simple answer to that is uh, providing long-term, stable 
job opportunities to people who live in neighborhoods, who are born and raised generationally, you know, have are from the neighborhood. Having the um, sense of agency to invest in and, and really grow uh, in terms of economic wealth, their neighborhood, building ourselves and our neighborhood and our communities up together. So that's the opportunity that worker co-ops provide. Um, and we do that by, obviously, we have a grocery retail operation, right? So we are selling goods uh, to community members. Healthy, holistic wellness is what we're selling here in terms of beautiful produce. <laughs> but what's, what's happening also is we're constantly learning how to run a business operation, how to cut our expenses, how to pay ourselves more instead of outsourcing consultants, right? How do we invest in ourselves and in each other? That's what worker co-ops offer to our communities. vegan products. I just want to start by saying that. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of pantry, shelf stable, um, we have a lot of like rice noodles and noodles, uh, a lot of pasta options. You can make products vegan, um, like spaghetti or any kind of pasta. You can kind of make it vegan. We have jackfruit that is unseasoned. So you can make it and taste like barbecue. You can make it taste like you know, spaghetti meatballs, you can season it and make it um, taste however you want, but it's still vegan. Um, we have drinks. I mean, all of the drinks in this section, for the most part, are vegan. We only have, I think, maybe three drinks that have dairy in it, milk products that have dairy um, in this section, but we have a lot of kombuchas. Um, we even have, I love this product. This is um, Taranga Baobab. Uh, it's, a, it's made by a beautiful Senegalese family that are located in San Francisco and they're sourcing their baobab from their community in Senegal and it's a delicious product that I just love here. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, lots of sparkling waters, chai tea, guayaki, I mean, yeah, all of this is vegan. And then this is my favorite snack section <laughs> right here. We got chips and salt. I mean, come on, if you're vegan. You already know chips and salsa guacamole that's where it is but we also have vision sauce which is really delicious it's an almond based uh, spread and sauce that I literally just dip like raw broccoli and peppers and carrots into it and it's just so long yeah <laughs> I mean we have a ton of vegan yeah oh yeah the veginase <laughs> so obviously the popular ones beyond Sausage Beyond Burger, the Field Roast Burgers, Celebration Roast, Soy Riso. Um, these are really good. I don't know if people are super familiar, but this is just like mushroom like deli slices. So you can make sandwiches are really good. Uh, and then obviously you have the tofu, the different tofus. Yeah. Miyoko's Cat uh, Creamery makes the really delicious nut-based creamy cheeses that are dairy alternatives obviously but I buy them during the holidays when I want to like kind of splurge so they're a little bit pricey but they are so decadent and rich tasting and they're they're fully nut based the cheddar the mozzarella the parmesan I mean you could literally make pizza you can put the alternative parmesan on your salads which I've done it's really delicious um, yeah, lots of alternatives. We even have alternatives to yogurt, which if you, not, if you don't know, we're about to put you on. This right here, where's this? This cashew yogurt vanilla bean is so delicious. Um, yeah, I can't even, uh, I just, I love to make um, like uh, yogurt parfaits. So put a little bit of sugar-free granola, slice some strawberries, 
put that on, you know, layer it. Oh, so good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we have alternative butters. Better Butter is a local company and that's, uh, or the Cultured Kitchen is local. They make delicious alternative butters. We have this coconut yogurt that they also make, a coconut-based yogurt. It's very versatile. I mean, you could, you could do a ton of stuff with this. Uh, cook with it, and yeah. This is another really decadent macadamia nut milk creamer. Yeah, great. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is James Bell. I'm here to talk with you guys a little bit about the history of how Mandela Grocery Cooperative came into existence and also about how areas like uh, like West Oakland that also exist in Vallejo similar economically would benefit from having a store like Mandela Grocery there. So one of the, one of the things that I like that was really original about the way this store came into existence was that there was a group of community individuals that came together with the general idea of putting a grocery store here with the influence of various elders and various people in the community who just yearned for groceries to be here. And then you had those various individuals who continuously poured their energy and their effort into making this idea come into you know, fruition. And you know, it's very uh, trying at times. You know, a lot of people you know, giving up and a lot of people losing faith in the idea, but people who really wanted to see the thing come into fruition really stuck with it and really became the driving forces behind helping to cultivate a lot of, you know, the, the background and the back end of the store ideals as far as like, you know, the policies, and as far as like, you know, a lot of worker set manuals and a lot of um, ideals on how structure was going to be built out for the built out phase and things like that. So yeah, like a lot of influence from people in the very beginning that were just, you know, putting their effort and their time in genuinely without expecting to be paid because, you know, like you can't have, you can't have something, you can't have an ideal building into a like cooperative or some type of business venture and not expect to put some type of sweat equity into you know your venture like you know have to you know do some things because you have to do them and you know that's the reality and so you know but that's a little bit about how the store came into existence oh i also wanted to talk about you know the product assortment so the way that the individuals chose what were going to be sold in the store was that we went out and did canvassing and basically went to the general area here and knocked on people's doors and actually asked the people like if there was a store in the community here what would you want to see the store sell and so that was how the very first product assortment was put together from you know influence from the community and the people here that way, you know, we knew, you know, we'd be selling things that, you know, people wanted. So people, you always want to involve the people in, you know, what it is that you're building out, especially if you're going to service the people, because if it's for the people who better to tell you what they want than them, you know, so always listen to the people. But, you know, a little bit on why areas in Vallejo would benefit from a store like this the same because so I've had various family members who lived in Vallejo and a lot of areas remind me of like West Oakland and East Oakland what you would call urban areas or hoods or whatnot you know it's like liquor stores and uh, gas stations and fast food everywhere you know and a lot of places just don't have grocery stores so simply, I would say one of the ways that areas in Vallejo benefit from having a grocery store such as this one in their area will be you will have people there taking control economically of their existence and 
of a particular entity that will be serving the community that will then empower them and, you know, make them feel a lot better about what they do every day. It will be more than just a job, especially for those who conceptually, you know, who, who actually gets it and who, you know, realizes that the importance of, you know, doing this work because it's basically you taking control of your existence, especially if you're genuinely putting the work in to try to help the business excel, you know. That's one way, you know, you can empower the people and provide service to the community is very needed, you know. And then also, I would say, one other way that areas in Malaya will benefit from us having a store like this there, it'll just be, everyone will be becoming more healthy and more conscious about what they eat, and, you know, like, I be, my belief is that, you know, when you have conditions such as food deserts where you have liquor stores on every corner and fast food everywhere and you have a lack of grocery stores, then of course it's going to equal, like, you know, people to be obese and people to be unhealthy and people to be very ill and stuff like that. It's just simple mathematics. So, you know, if we want to change things in our community, if this is the status quo, then we have to put the entities there that we know that are missing that is going to help benefit our communities and help make them better for the generations to come and make those entities into cooperatives if they don't exist already. Thank you! That was so much fun. And now I'm hungry for both food and change. Thank you, Mandela Grocery, for giving us a tour and sharing the importance of worker-owned cooperatives. For any Vallejoans in attendance, if you are interested in working with us to bring a worker-owned cooperative to Vallejo, please send us a message either in the Q&A box here or on social media, or send an email to info at foodispower.org. Together, we can help make this a reality. Now, coming up next to dance their way into your hearts is the Ohana o Lokomaikai Dance Group. This Vallejo-based troupe has been together for over 17 years and has performed at many fairs throughout the region and at community events in and around Solano County, including the 2019 Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. They are a family-oriented group that loves to share the Aloha spirit with their audience. The group's director, Michelle Ganzon Bonnet, is passionate about sharing her hula family with us today. Today, the Ohana dancers will be performing a variety of dances from both Hawaii and Tahiti. For their Hawaiian hula performance, the dancers will be using their hands to tell the story of a love lost, and their Tahitian dance is about everyday life and the beauty of the island of Tahiti. We are so happy to have the Ohana Dance Group join us for their second year at the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest and enchant us with their skilled and soulful dances from the islands of the Pacific. Please welcome into your homes, Ohana Olokomaikai Dance Group.
Thank you for that amazing performance. What a wonderful display of color and culture. Let us know in the chat what you thought about that fiery performance. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Lauren Ornelas. Lauren is a proud Chicanx and the founder and president of Food Empowerment Project, or FEP. Lauren has been active in the animal rights movement since 1987 and founded FEP in 2007 to showcase how we can create a more just and sustainable world by recognizing the power of one's food choices. She has investigated factory farms, run consumer campaigns, and worked with Nash activists nationwide. Fun fact, Lauren has been vegan since high school. Wow. Today, Food Empowerment Project hosts the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival each year to amplify the voices of Vallejoans and to show that they are coming together to create unique solutions within their community. The goal of this event is to create enthusiasm and a demand for change and to share with everyone that healthy food is not only healthy and delicious, but should be accessible in Vallejo and uses this event to spotlight the beauty and diversity of our community. Here to discuss the importance of the lack of access to healthy foods, please join me and welcome Lauren Ornelas. Hey everyone, I'm Lauren Ornelas. I am the founder of Food Empowerment Project. Thank you so much for coming and listening in on our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest this year. As I'm sure you know, we've had to do it differently this year due to COVID-19 but we wanted to make sure that we still were able to celebrate the beautiful community of Vallejo. Not sure if this is your first food fest with us or your third or your fourth or your fifth, but we're really glad to have you here. I just wanted to give a little bit of background and the, some of the work that we've been doing in the community as well as why we're doing it and what we see as some of the next steps. So although many of you who live in Vallejo are very familiar with the problem with lack of access to healthy food, um, this is a problem that takes place not only in Vallejo, not only in the United States, but around the globe. And it's primarily an issue that impacts Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. So we have been taking a look at these issues in Northern California, and we were asked um, a number of years ago by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party, David Hilliard, to take a look at what was happening where he lived. Uh, I connected with him to learn more about the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program, and in turn told him about our work. He asked me if we could take a look to see what was happening there in terms of lack of access to healthy food. So that's really why we came to Vallejo. From there, we connected with other um, activists in the area to make sure that our work would be valuable to them, and we found out it would be. So we joined up with organizations such as Vallejo People's Garden um, to try to take a look at what access to healthy food um, looked like in the community. And we first did this by doing little focus groups to try to make sure that the fruits and vegetables and other foods that we would be serving would actually be culturally appropriate. As I'm sure many of you know, Vallejo is incredibly diverse and um, represents the Black, Filipinx, and Latinx community members. And so we, incur we increased um, the various types of fruits and vegetables um, as part of our survey sheet. And so what we did is we gathered volunteers, um, by People's Garden, collected some as well. And we actually surveyed every establishment that sold food except for restaurants and fast food. So we surveyed the grocery stores, the convenience stores and liquor stores. And what you can see here is just a sample of um, the survey tool. The survey tool actually ended up being quite long, um, but this just gives you an idea of some of the, the fruits um, that we surveyed for in the community. After we collected all the data, we put out our report highlighting what we found in our survey results. And we shared this information and in our reports with policymakers uh, from the city council up to our federal legislators. And this report is available um, to you. Um, if you live in Vallejo, we'd be happy to mail you a copy in English or in Spanish. Uh, they are also available on our website at foodispower.org. But some of our findings we found, um, and again, if you live in the community, you're probably very familiar with this, that the vast majority of liquor stores and convenience stores are in the low-income communities, predominantly the black and brown communities, where you have 88% of all the liquor stores and 71% of all the convenience stores in the low-income communities. This area also has very few grocery stores. So 
Um, you can see here in this pie chart that 46% of the convenience stores and 29% of liquor stores is actually where people living in these communities have to get their food from. Now, if you look at the higher income area pie chart, you can actually still see though that the community as a whole doesn't have a whole lot of grocery stores, but it's far worse in the black and brown communities than any of the other ones. Now, we also looked at the availability of meat and dairy alternatives. And we did this because we know that one, a diet high in fruits and vegetables is better for your health. But we also would like people to be able to choose if they wanna go vegan or not, if they wanna not participate in the suffering of non-human animals. Um, and again, as a vegan organization, um, this little calf represents um, why, why we encourage people to not consume any type of animal products. Um, but we also wanted to point out a couple of other things. One is that, the, if you can see here, very few um, locations had access to meat and dairy alternatives. And although a lot of people call uh, what happens in these communities food deserts or things such as that, we, uh, we kind of agree more with those who want us to call it what it righteously should be called, which, are, which is food, is, food apartheid. So um, that is what we call it. And, and I think that dairy really highlights why we talk about this, because in our communities, in Black and Brown Indigenous communities, many times what's available to us is actually cow or goat milk. And for those of us, like myself, who's a very proud Chicana, so I'm uh, Mexican, um, Columbus actually brought cows over on the fourth voyage. And so it's not something that my ancestors normally drink. It wasn't something that was normal to our diets. It wasn't something that we had available to us. So that's why many of us are what some people call lactose intolerant. Um, and Food and Power Project isn't a fan of that term because once again, it puts the onus on black and brown people as if there's something wrong with us because we don't digest the milk of another species. When and in fact, it's a product of colonization and it's a product of colonization that we're still dealing with today. So when these locations don't have these dairy alternatives, what's happening is that we're being forced to drink cow's milk or goat's milk, which is actually gonna make us sick. So we do feel like we need to, to draw these connections and show that this lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, which is good for our health, and the lack of alternatives to cow milk, all it's doing is negatively impacting our health. It's negatively impacting the health of black and brown people in the communities and around the world. So one of the other things we recognized when we started doing our work in Vallejo, and some of you are probably very familiar with this because you've lived it, is that there was a Safeway location in downtown where senior living facilities were, as well as a lot of black and brown people living there. And a Safeway had been based downtown. They moved from that location, they relocated miles away. And when they left that location, they put what's called a restrictive deed on their former property preventing any grocery store from moving in for 15 years, which deprived that community from having a grocery store. So this is an effort that we have taken nationwide, trying to get Safeway to change this corrupt, inhumane and unjust policy. We have a petition on our website that we would love for you to sign. And if you have any type of recollection about this or anything you could write or do a video and share with us, we'd love to share that with that corporation as well. So after we did our report, we then followed up in focus groups. We did seven focus groups in Vallejo with um, the Filipinx community, Black community, one we did in Spanish, and one we did with the homeless. Um, we did these focus groups. We fed everybody a vegan meal, and we paid everybody $50 for their time. And we released our report, again, sharing it with all policymakers. And what we found in this report was similar to what we've seen before, which is one of the biggest barriers to people being able to eat healthy and being able to access fresh food is actually the cost of it, which is why we've really pushed towards supporting living wages, rather it be from a local level to corporate levels, but all living wages to make sure there's some equity. Because for people to be able to eat healthy, they have to be able to afford the food. As an organization that works on farm worker justice issues as well, we know that we don't need that produce getting any cheaper. We need more equity. We need everybody to be able to have living wages and to be able to afford the food. We also found that many people who were immigrants who were um, living in the community ate healthier from their home countries than they do here because they didn't want to buy things like tomato sauce. They rather use fresh tomatoes. Um, in terms of our solutions, um, we really look to things like people growing their own food and supporting places like Vallejo People's Garden. 
We also really want to bring something like Mandela Grocery Cooperative to Vallejo. In fact, we did three community meetings, bringing the owner of one of the owners of uh, Mandela to the community. We fed everybody a delicious vegan meal. Um, but our goal is really to have something like Mandela's Worker Cooperative. And the reason why is because the workers own the business. They make the decisions on the profits. They make the decisions on the benefits that the community is going to get. And they also, this type of job provides skills. It provides entrepreneurial skills for anybody who works there for a lifetime. So we really want to see what happens in Vallejo. And we've in our um, focus groups, we had 100% support from everybody. Once they understood what a worker-owned cooperative was, they really wanted to be a part of something like that in the community. The, our focus groups found people wanted to buy food locally. They wanted to have businesses that were local. So you know, our hope now is moving forward, and we want to work with all of you, is to see more people being able to grow their own food, as well as having something like a worker-owned cooperative so the money that's invested is spent in the community is invested back into the community and we can help the community thrive. So as always, we welcome any of your questions, your feedback, and we definitely want you to get involved because we know that we can help Vallejo turn the corner on having more access to healthy foods, having better health in the community if we all work together. And we thank all of you so much for the time and effort you have put with us and the surveying, the focus groups, and trying to get Mandela um, to come to the community. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. We hope you really enjoy yourself at the rest of the festival. And uh, we do hope to be able to do it in person next year. If not, we'll see you online next year. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for those words of inspiration and reminding us to continue to fight for healthy foods in all of our communities. Last but not least, we would like to take you on a quick tour and introduce you to a Vallejo business called Sunshine Smoothies and Coffee, a drive through shop at 821 Wilson Avenue, just off of Highway 37. Carlos Ortega is the owner and has a very beautiful story about how Sunshine Smoothies came to be the hometown favorite it is today. As a child in El Salvador, Carlos Ortega envisioned becoming a farmer, smoothie and juice maker, and today he has fulfilled that childhood dream. And yet it was also the furthest thing from his mind as he finished school in Richmond, California after his mother brought him to the United States over 15 years ago. But today, Carlos is a farmer and purveyor of fresh, never frozen, smoothies and juices, plus coffee and other goodies here in Vallejo at Sunshine Smoothies and Coffee. If you are in town and visit the drive through smoothie shop, Carlos also has two fruit and vegetable bins containing the various items produced on Ortega's 30-acre Tahama County farm. We grow apples, cherries, peaches, nectarines, and Bartlett pears, and more depending on the season, says Carlos. His smoothies have names like Purple Giant, which contain delicious fruits like mangoes, pineapples, and beets. And other farm fresh fruits and veggies also go into the jams and a special pico de gallo that Ortega sells as Sunshine Smoothies and Coffee. Last year, we were grateful to have the uh, owner, Carlos Ortega, and his wife sell vegan smoothies and juices at the 2019 Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. And thank goodness they did, as the temperature reached 90 degrees during last year's event and his cold drinks are exactly what we all needed. Without further ado, please join me in acknowledging a valuable business in our Vallejo community, Sunshine Smoothies and Coffee.
you Vallejo Food Festival for your support. Since we couldn't have our in-person event this year, please try to support this small owned business that is located locally owned by a person of color. We purchased some Sunshine Smoothie gift cards to give away, so look out in your emails to see if you are randomly selected as a winner. So before we close today's event, we're going to bring the Food Empowerment Project team on screen to answer all the questions you have been sending us throughout the event. Please send us any other questions you may have now through the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our best to get through as many of them as possible before we run out of time. As a final reminder, that if you're one of the first 16 Vallejo resident attendees, we will be giving you a free vegan cookbook. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. Now, while we give you a moment to post your questions, I am going to turn it over to Food Empowerment Project Executive Director, Sharanya Prasad, to, to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you, Erica. I'm sure you felt Erica's energy and enthusiasm throughout the program. As our Vallejo community organizer, hasn't Erica been an amazing MC for this event? Thank you, Erica. As Erica said, I'm the Executive Director of Food Empowerment Project. And on behalf of our organization, I wanna thank you all for attending today's event and for your support of FEP's work, especially in Vallejo. I hope you enjoyed today's program and you will join us again next Saturday. We have another amazing lineup, so we don't want you to miss out on that. When we first decided to make this event virtual, none of us were sure how we could pull it off but what you saw today has truly been a team effort behind the scenes. And I wanna take this opportunity to introduce the entire FEP team to you. Ethan Eldrith, our web content and database manager is the wizard behind all the technology that we use to create today's videos. Ethan is an invaluable member of the team and I'm relieved and grateful to have him with us to help with all the technical logistics. Thank you, Ethan. Our communications and marketing manager, Erica Galera, helped promote the event online and with the media. In the weeks leading up to the event, she also worked closely with Erica and Ethan to rehearse and ensure that the event went smoothly. Thank you, Erica. You've already met Lauren Ornelas, but I cannot exclude her from being mentioned. Lauren founded Food Empowerment Project and has led our programs, including our Vallejo work, since the start. Her visionary thinking has made our organization what it is today, and I'm grateful for Lauren every day. Thank you for everything, Lauren. Thank you all again for being with us today, and I hope you and your family stay happy, healthy, and safe, and I hope to see you next week. I know Erica Galera now has something special to show all of you before we get to your questions. Erica, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Sharanya. Um, so I am so excited um, to share our project that we've been working really hard on. Um, it is our vegan Filipino food booklet, recipe booklet. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, we have our vegan Mexican food recipe booklet that we produced, was it last year? I think it was last year that we did it. Um, or the year before and it was a big hit and we definitely wanted to do the same for our veganfilipinofood.com website as well so i'm going to ask ethan to share the preview of the booklet's front page we won't we're only giving you a sneak peek that's it um you're gonna have to wait <laughs> for the rest of it um but you'll see it right here along with our vegan mexican food booklets so last week, we were not able to share our vegan Mexican food booklet with all of you. So we're sharing it now. It is still Latinx Heritage Month until the 15th. So we do not want to forget about that. But this month, we are also celebrating Filipino American History Month. Um, so it's, I'm really excited to just be able to share this with all of you. There is a lot of amazing recipes included. And yeah, hope you like the sneak peek. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. 
Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so now we will give you another few uh, seconds to enter some more questions into the chat. And we're going to start with our first question that is going to go to our founder, Lauren Ornelas. And that first question is, do you know if there is a grocery co-op in Marin or Sonoma County? And this question was submitted by Yvonne Goodrich. Um, unfortunately, no, there is not a worker owned cooperative in um, Marin or Sonoma. I know that um, community market was at one time, but I don't know that they are anymore. And again, community markets in Santa Rosa and in Sebastopol. Um, the only worker owned cooperative in general that I know of in our area is actually Alvarado Street Bakery. So um, I don't know if you'll know that they have like a little patch sometimes in the back of their bread that says vegan because not all of their bread is vegan, um, but they do have some vegan bread. But I don't know of any um, worker owned cooperatives um, in terms of a grocery store in Marin or Sonoma yet. Um, I wanted to just chime in really quick. Um, I, Lauren, and maybe you have the answer to this. Um, Eras, is it Eras Mindy? Are they a worker owned cooperative? They are the bread. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they have some really good vegan pizza, just <laughs> FYI. They're in Oakland and in, in San Rafael, is that yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that they were there now. But yeah, they do breads primarily, but they're also worker owned. Excellent point. And Erica, while I have you, thank you <laughs> and Eva for all the great work that you did on the vegan Filipino food booklet. And we're really excited. It is gonna be in English and Tagalog. So we will have those, and if you signed up, um, they, and we will be able to send those to you. So you probably saw that. Um, so don't forget, sign up to our survey. Yes, thank you, Lauren. In my rush of anxiety <laughs> talking about it, I forgot to thank Eva, who's actually attending today. So thank you, Eva, um, me and her, and uh, Victoria, who was the artist behind the cover and the inside um, art as work artwork as well. Um, we're all 3 p nice and we were just so happy and excited and we're so proud to just get this out to our community. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Wonderful. And also just in case you didn't see it, if, if anyone is interested in learning more about the hula, Tahitian dances and workout classes, please email Ohana localmaikai at gmail.com and we will make sure to get that information to you in our follow-up email as well. We hope everyone enjoyed those videos. Thank you so much, Michelle. She's an amazing force of dance and culture here in the Vallejo community. So our next question coming up is around the topic of food cooperatives in Vallejo. So Francie McMillan asks, where does the effort to have a food cooperative in Vallejo stand at this point? So I'll just give a little bit of background on um, how this all came about and where the process has been. So I'm sure I know a lot of you know that we've been talking about trying to bring something like Mandela to the community. And after we did our focus groups and we heard back from the community that there was 100% interest in having a worker owned cooperative, we then organized the three community groups, brought Mandela with us. Um, then we had a meeting with some community leaders as well as the mayor of the time, um, Sempayan. And um, he seemed to be interested in bringing the worker owned cooperatives, um, but nothing ever came of it. Um, which is just like our um, desire to put a restrict uh, ordinance in Vallejo to prevent Safeway from devastating the community again, nothing happened with that. So I will say right here and now, please don't forget to vote. Please don't forget to hold our policymakers accountable for um, what they can have an impact on your health in Vallejo. It's very, very important that you let them know. So um, anyway, so after we realized, after trying to work with the mayor's um, office, we weren't getting anywhere. And so um, what our then goal was to bring uh, people to Mandela, including some city council members. Uh, but we could never get the city council members to commit to coming with us to Mandela. So uh, we've kind of, I mean, the reason why it was so important for us to try to bring some policymakers in is because 
we know that with Mandela and Oakland, the, the city was vested in it. The city was vested in the health of the community and put some money into it. Um, but where we're at now is that um, COVID hit. Um, and so we were unable to do that. Our goal is still to work on bringing the cooperative there. We know that one of our main people we were working with had a lot come up and happen in her life, so she has been unable to spearhead it. But we do need someone who's from the Vallejo community to be the one to spearhead this. Mandela is 100% behind this, giving their time and their energy. And we just need somebody from the community, from the impacted community, to be honest. We had a um, researcher find two locations in Vallejo that seemed the best locations, and one of which was in South Vallejo. So um, we know where they should go. We know that there was um, a, there was a building at some point that would have worked, um, but we need to, we, we, we can't do it, right? We follow community lead. We wanna be there to support somebody who takes the lead on this. Um, we wanna do the surveying to make sure that the food that's gonna be sold is gonna be the best for the community, but we need to make sure that the community wants it and we wanna back them up, but we don't believe in putting our voices um, into the community. So. Um, that's where it's at. We're kind of, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with the election there. Um, and maybe we'll have somebody on board who is, um, cares about the health of the community and will do whatever they can to bring something like a worker-owned cooperative to the community. But we are still 100% behind it. Mandela's behind it. And if anybody's watching this who's in an impacted community who wants to work with us, um, we will, we will help you along the way. One of the amazing things that we found out during this process was that you have to be an owner of the cooperative, which means you have to put money into it. So let's say everybody had to put a thousand dollars into it, or the owners, I should say, the owners have to put a thousand dollars into it. We could even have some of our members who live in another state sponsor that for you. So if you don't have that thousand dollars to become a member, or I'm sorry, an owner of the cooperative, we could try to help find that money. It's completely legal. It's something that Mandela told us about. And we want you to be the owners. You will be the owner of this. And Mandela is there and we're there to help. We just need to, we need to find the person who has the time um, to put to this. And we know a lot of you are impacted not only because of COVID, but be also because of the fires that we are all experiencing right now. Um, but we're not alone and know that us achieving something like this will be amazing for the community, not only the community health, the community's economy. Thank you so much for that, Lauren. That was so informative and I just learned something that I never knew before. So thank you so much. This next question is for our executive director, Sharanya. Uh, so Lauren talked a lot about, you know, the ways that FEP wants to support and um, work her own cooperatives. What are some ways that folks at home can help food empowerment projects work? Yes, happy to respond to that one. So I know that in the chat, um, we had shared links to our Safeway campaign. So we do have campaigns online that constantly need people to, you know, voice their concerns and sign petitions and things like that. Um, FEP is also constantly looking for volunteers. We have a lot of work that we feel we can get done if we have more help. Um, so if you are interested in volunteering for FEP, then that's something we definitely uh, recommend and we would really appreciate if you can put time into it. Um, and of course, we have a, a good number of members and supporters who are uh, donating to us. And so that really helps sustain our work in the long term. But the most thing that we need right now is for you to be able to give us your time. And if you have time, like Lauren said, to do things like the Mandela, uh, model in Vallejo to have a worker owned co-op, then that would be amazing. Absolutely. I 100% agree. And so speaking to all the work that FEP is doing, what is FEP's most interesting campaign or work that there, that, you know, we are doing that is most interesting to you? Yeah, I can start and I think everyone should take a turn with this one. Um, when I joined FEP in June, at that point, I had mostly been involved with um, animal uh, organizations and animal um, rights type of work. But after joining FEP and just in the past few months, I've learned so much 
about how all of these issues are so connected and there are so many ways that we can link um, you know, humans with non-human animals and the environment. And so now I actually feel like our farm worker work is the most interesting to me because I'm learning constantly with that. Uh, but just our treatment in the you know, American food system of produce workers um, and the inequalities and the inequities that are involved in the process, I think that's been very eye-opening and it's very interesting to me. Absolutely. Um, from the rest of the team, what is your most, what's your favorite work that FEP does for the community? Um, I'll go next. Um, I think just our work right now, speaking specifically to Vallejo, I love that we are so invested, I would say, with the community um, and that I've never worked with an organization, not to say that I have a lot of experience, but I've never worked with an organization that actually puts the community first um, and thinks about the community and the knowledge and um, expertise they have being community members. <laughs> um, so I, I just love that FEP um, acknowledges that and actually works with the community instead of going in there and saying they know what's best and you know does all that. It's, it's really community focused. Absolutely. Lauren? Well, I have to say, when we talk about volunteers, I just wanted to remind everybody that Erica Hazel was one of our volunteers. She had attended our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest um, one year, and the next year she was like, what can I do to help out? And we put her to work and saw how amazing she was and was like, hey, how about becoming our community organizer? So, you know, things like this happen sometimes, and we're very thankful. Um, for you again, putting yourself out there and figuring out how you could be a part of it. Um, you know, it's hard. Maria Gavetta, um, who we um, did a tribute to in our last one, I mean, she's who made me fall in love with Vallejo. And I'm still incredibly excited about making Vallejo. Um, I, I guess I look at Vallejo just as, as a, a city of such possibilities. And I don't say possibilities and think gentrification and think, oh my God, it could have these really hot spots to eat. I think of Vallejo still being that amazing community, the amazing, there's so many artists that are there um, and really just being a, a, a guiding light to other communities to where you don't have to turn to gentrification. You don't have to turn into people changing your community. Your community can be vibrant and healthy and passionate and diverse just keeping it the way it is, but having that money stay there and having the celebrations of who everybody is. And I think that um, I'm just excited about that um, example for the world, um, that I don't, I'd, I'd hate to see Vallejo change and become like some parts of Oakland are now. No offense, love Oakland, but you know what I mean. You know, you still want to be able to see the color, the beauty, the music of Vallejo without it being, for lack of a better phrase, whitewashed. Absolutely. Erica, G, did you have something you wanted to uh, drop in the chat too? No, no, no. <laughs> Just giving snaps for oh, Lauren. <laughs> love the snaps. Absolutely. We have two more questions in the chat that I would love to get to. Yvonne Goodrich asks, I know most propositions and measures on our ballots are local, but does FEP have resources on measures and propositions to support on ballots. In other words, a resource guide on who and what to support. Thank you so much for that question, Yvonne. I think that's a great question in terms of how would FEP um, give any like tips or suggestions on how folks should vote in this upcoming election. So I would love to be able to tell everybody how I think they should vote, but I'm not allowed to. Um, FEP is a 501c3. We cannot um, encourage you on who to vote for, but we can um, talk about the propositions. Uh, we are a supporter. Um, we're listed as one of the supporters of Prop 16. Um, and whoever asked this question, they're like reading my mind because we always have our staff meetings on Monday. And my staff meeting for Monday is like, Erica, we got to have these propositions that we support and don't support when the ballots drop. Uh, when we start getting them in the mail. So um, we will be posting that on our social media. I'm making an assumption, Erica. 
um, but we need to talk about them all. I've got a list of what we've already collected from a lot of other organizations, including environmental justice organizations, and we will be sharing that, but we can only really share our opinions on the ballot initiative. Awesome, thank you. And someone very close to my heart also asked in the Q&A where to purchase our vegan cookbooks. Erica, it's never too late to go vegan. How to eat like a vegetarian. Erica Galera, do you want to answer uh, where to purchase? And I assume uh, we're asking about the vegan Mexican food and vegan Filipino food cookbooks. Yeah, so uh, the vegan Mexican food um, booklet, you can send us an email with your mailing address and we can get one of those out to you. They're in English and Spanish, so you just have to let us know which you would like. You can also order on our Square store. I'll drop the link in the chat box um, after this, just that, so you can go there and order if you want to. Vegan Filipino food is not quite done yet. We just got them to the printer. So we're hoping to have them soon. Um, and they will, they will also be available where you can just send us an email or on our Square store as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we have about five minutes left. Um, this question is for anyone uh, on the team. What advice would you give to someone who is not vegan, but wants to be, especially how to get started and living in a Vale an area like Vallejo that does not have a lot of great options for fresh produce. Um, I wanted to kick this one off because as a lifelong resident of Vallejo and currently a dual resident of Vallejo and the city of Berkeley, I absolutely love the Vallejo farmer's market on Saturdays. It is my go-to place. I get so many amazing things, um, including fresh, produce, organic produce, and I love to support all the local vendors. I've been going to the Vallejo Farmer's Market for years. So anyone else, what advice would you give to someone who is not vegan, but wants to be? I can speak um, not from the perspective of being from Vallejo, because I'm not. I'm originally from India, um, but I would say look to your roots because I feel like a lot of our cultures have plant-based options and we just have to look to find them. We've changed our diets so much over time, uh, adapting to where we have to live. Um, but if we go back to the roots, then I'm sure you'll find something that will speak to you. Erica, Lauren, anyone else have any uh, suggestions on where to get started with eating more plant-based and vegan? I really like what Shadanya says, going back to your roots. Um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily any advice or anything, but being a Filipina whose family, I was raised on like a lot of heavy meat, meat um, in all the dishes, um, all the recipes had some kind of pig product in it. Um, uh, but kind of going back even further, um, I learned that my, my Lolo, my grandpa, he, um, he was Ilocano. And so this is kind of going into a little more, but sorry. Um, so my favorite dish is Binak Bet, which is a very heavy vegetable um, recipe, a Filipino recipe. And when I was talking to my dad about it, um, he was saying that oftentimes they wouldn't even put me in it because there, there's just an abundance of fresh produce where they live. Um, so I, I like that idea of going back to our roots because you can learn more um, and kind of stay true to your roots, but at the same time, just stay true to your ethics, I guess, as well. Thank you. I, I'll just add one quick thing that if you are in a community like Vallejo that lacks access to healthy foods and you are wanting to go vegan, one, we recognize that it's difficult. Right. I mean, it, it's, if you don't have fresh produce, I mean, I'm Mexican. It's not healthy to tell me just eat rice and beans all day. Right. That's just not realistic and it's not fair. It's a very privileged perspective. Um, but I do think that that's why we want to work with you. And so if you're watching this and you're not from Vallejo and you're thinking this is like my community, this is why we're in Vallejo. Right. People have a right to have a choice. People have a right to eat their ethics. And so we want to be able to help you um, have what should be your right access to healthy foods. Absolutely. Thank you so much from the team. These were all great 
uh, responses to that question. And our last, last question before we close out today is for Erica Galera. Where can folks learn more about the work FEP is doing and how can they stay informed? Sure. Um, so you can visit our website, foodispower.org, foodispower.org. Um, we have an extensive amount of information on that website um, that'll take you in many different directions um, for what you want to learn about, um, including all the different program areas that we work on. So veganism, farm workers' rights, lack of access to healthy foods, and um, slavery in the chocolate industry. Um, you can also follow us on social media. So we have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and a LinkedIn. So And oh, also YouTube, you can follow us there. Um, and we post regularly, not on YouTube, um, but we do post our big videos, just like these events will be posted on YouTube in the next week. Um, but yeah, follow us there. We post regularly on all the other social media channels. And last, you can sign up to our monthly e-newsletter. So we only send one out a month, maybe two during the you know fundraising time, but I'm sure you understand that, um, but it just keeps you up to date on the work that we're doing, um, any kind of shout outs, any kind of take action items, anything that you can do to help our work. Absolutely, thank you so much. So we wanna thank everyone for all your questions and for participating in today's event. To recap, today we learned about how to make some delicious, comforting vegan Philippinex recipes, learn more about grocery cooperatives and traveled, to the Pacific Islands to enjoy Hawaiian and Tahitian dances. I really hope you enjoyed today's program and we are excited for you to join us next week. Next week's theme will be happy, healthy communities. We will be sharing some tasty vegan soul food, learning more about our health with plant-based diets, and you won't want to miss Chef Sarah's musical performance. We want to thank you for joining us. And if you're interested in viewing this event with Spanish captions, the video will be available one week after today. If you've registered, keep an eye out for an email for when it will be available. And we will see you next Saturday at noon Pacific time for the last day of the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest 2020. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.